So hello everybody, welcome to the uh, IAMP seminar, which is a recurrent event of the International Association of Mathematical Physics. As you might guess, our association is always looking for new members, so check our webpage. Uh, our speaker today is Alexander Stottmeister from the University of Hanover. Alex has been working for many years at the intersection of the um, renormalization group, algebraic quantum field theory and quantum information. And today he will speak about embezzlement of entanglement, quantum fields and the classification of von Neumann algebras. So Alex, please go ahead. Okay, well, thanks Wojciech for the nice introduction and um, of course also for the invitation to speak here. So yeah, as you already said, I want to talk about this topic of embezzlement of entanglement and how it relates to quantum fields and the classification of Neumann algebras. And I first of all want to thank also my co-authors on the papers shown below because um, well, they have really greatly contributed to this project. So. It's not, not a single effort, I just want to say this here. And to start with, well, since I'm not a native speaker of English, you know, so I had to look up what embezzlement actually means. So if you look at the Cambridge Dictionary, you find the following definition, namely that it's the crime of secretly taking money that is in your care or that belongs to an organization or business you work for. And of course, I mean, here we are not interested in the embezzlement of money but of uh, resources in general but to illustrate this phenomenon with a nice sketch so there's this uh, idea of well how to embezzle chocolate uh, so there's this nice cartoon sketch where you break up a bar of chocolate into various pieces you rearrange them and miraculously you find that you got a new piece out of it uh, so of course, this is not really embezzlement, but it kind of illustrates what we want to do. Why it's not embezzlement because it's usually easy to detect if you do something like this. Yeah, and in the definition, it was—I mean, the, the word "secret" was mentioned, so it should not be easy to detect. To detect. But okay, so let's go on. So the idea is, um, what we want to do here is using entanglement or treating entanglement as a resource and we want to define what is embezzlement of entanglement and in this case it should be the crime of secretly taking entanglement um, of course crime in quotation marks and um, to illustrate this further what the situation a bipartite setup you have Alice and Bob two agents with their local quantum systems which are illustrated by these um, laptops which are initialized in some some uh, local product state for these two systems and what they do now also have is a shared resource which you can kind of think of as the bank and the entanglement is the money stored in this bank so this will be given in terms of a state on another tensor product system in this uh, initial setting, yeah, so which is also shared by Alice and Bob. And this resource state is the state omega AB, which both Alice and Bob have locally access to. And now, as I said before, the main part about this embezzlement thing is that you want to do this uh, crime of taking entanglement secretly. So in a sense, you want to ensure that there is no record of your crime you know, in this setting. So everything should be done without classical communication between Alice and Bob, which means that um, you should only perform local operations in, uh, with Alice and only local operations with Bob. Uh, and this is idealized now in the following way. So what you have as your initial state of the total system is you have this resource state, omega AB, and the initial states of Alice and Bob, and you want to act with local unitaries, which only access either the A part of the shared system or the B part of the shared system. And you want to transform this into a new product state where now the shared system between and the shared state between the local systems of A and Bob 
uh, Alice and Bob have uh, have some entanglement. You know, so this spectrum of psi here. So this should not be a product state anymore. But of course, as you can convince yourself by, for example, looking at the Schmidt decomposition of this shared state, um, this is not possible. At least in finite dimensions and also in infinite dimensions, it has been shown that in the tensor product setting, you cannot do this, and especially you cannot do this exactly. And so with this equality here. But um, of course, with every uh, good no-go theorem, there comes the question of how can you get around it? Uh, so how can you relax some of the assumptions in a reasonable way that you can still do something non-trivial? And like 20 years ago, it had been observed by Van Damme and Hayden that you can define a certain interesting family of states on the resource on a finite dimensional resource system shared by Alice and Bob. Yeah, which has this peculiar form here. So these HN are just uh, normalization factors, which would correspond here to harmonic numbers. And this family of states has the nice property that if you use this in this definition of entanglement, uh, definition of embezzlement, which I was referring to before, so you, maybe you initialize your resource system in this state, and you also initialize the um, local systems of Alice and Bob in a, in a tensor product state. And now you look at all the possible unitaries to, that you can locally apply like uh, for Alice and Bob and look at the distance to a certain target state where you have not altered the resource state, but created some entangled state between Alice and Bob. So if you look at this quantity, it's norm distance that you, then you will find that you can actually make this distance go to zero provided you increase the dimension of this uh, resource state and keep the entanglement you want to extract fix, fixed. You know? So this uh, D quantifies uh, the Schmidt rank of this um, state psi. So it's a measurement of how, a measure of how much entanglement there is in this shared state. And such a family, uh, such families of states which satisfy this you know, relaxed uh, form of uh, embezzlement of entanglement have been come to known as um, embezzling families and you can actually show that the error you get in this setting is essentially optimal and I'm every embezzling Hilbert space sorry i'm confused about your hilbert space it seems like you're working with two copies of a and two copies of b uh yes so so you have uh, the local hilbert space let's say h a and h b which just belong to alice and bob and then you have a resource state and a hilbert space which is partly accessible to Alice and partly accessible to Bob. And here, this would mean that you have two copies, uh, essentially. Yeah, the, the full system that is accessible to Alice would be a tensor product of HA times HA prime, if you want, and the similar for Bob. So, so the resource state has its own Hilbert space, but it's in a sense, which I will make precise later on, only locally accessible by Alice. Okay. Okay. And um, yeah. So so what I wanted to say here is that essentially these these kind of families they are kind of unique in the sense that you expect this uh, Schmidt spectrum for the for the bezeling family to be essentially always of this form one over j, and we also will see in which sense this can be justified later on, and. The question we want to ask here, or we ask ourselves in this project is, um, can we actually find an idealized resource state? So can we find a single state omega that has this property instead of a family? You know? So in a sense, we want to take the limit in N, but of course, if we look at this family, then because of these diverging normalization factors, you cannot just simply, simply take the limit. Uh, so that will not exist in a sensible way. But um, nevertheless, we can ask, are there such states? Uh, and this, now uh, after this introduction, brings me to the main part of the talk where we, where, where I want to pose essentially three questions. Uh, so the first question will be, is there a quantum state um, that can embezzle states of arbitrary Schmidt rank to arbitrary precision? Uh, so are there systems and quantum states, resource states that, that have this property? And if we find some state like this in the system, then we will call this an, an embezzling state. And then even 
more interestingly or um, more boldly, we can ask, are there systems where actually all states are embezzling states? So you take this, this resource system and any state on it, and it will always be an embezzling state. Is this possible? If yes, we will call it a universal embezzler. And then the third question we can ask is, do we actually have at least an idealized sense universal embezzlers in nature? Also, it does, I mean, seems kind of unlikely if you look at it first, but I would try to convince you that actually the answer to all of these three questions will be yes, uh, where the third one might depend on your favorite theory of quantum gravity in a sense. Uh, but I will only comment on this later. It's more like a, um, uh, a curious observation. But now, um, since we had this no-go theorem about this exact uh, embezzling in the tensor product framework, uh, how can we get around it? And here, where the idea is to move from tensor product framework to the commuting operator framework, which might be quite familiar for people um, uh, familiar with non-local games or also the quantum field theory setting where you look at local operator algebras and they are usually not in tensor position to one another. Uh, but um, let me illustrate what I mean by this for the rest of the talk. So instead of um, looking at the shared resource Hilbert space of, of Alice and Bob as a tensor product of two local Hilbert spaces, I, they will just have a common Hilbert space. Uh, and quantum states, again, instead of being states of this product Hilbert space will be just uh, quantum states of this general resource Hilbert space. And the um, locality in the sense of the tensor product where Alice has some operators in one tensor factor and Bob has uh, operators in another tensor factors will be here modeled by two von Neumann subalgebras of the bounded operators of this resource Hilbert space, which are commuting with one another. And for technical reasons, we will assume here that we actually have some maximality assumption on these accessible operators, namely that what we will call here hard duality in, in a sense uh, related to how it's used in, in quantum field theory, and meaning that the operators that Alice can access on the, on the resource state are exactly those that commute with the operators that Bob has access to on the resource system. And we would additionally assume that there are no classical degrees of freedom in the game. So each of these operator algebras of Alice and Bob will be a factor, meaning that the intersection with its commutant will be trivial, which also means that if you take hard duality together with this property, that um, the joint operations that Alice and Bob have access to will generate all the operators on the uh, all the bounded operators on on your resource system, and we will also assume that um, all Hilbert spaces we are talking about are separable, uh, and that the algebras we are looking at, so the operator algebras that Alice and Bob are using, are always from Neumann algebras. So they are closed in the weak operator topology, meaning that you can take limits of uh, operators in expectation bounds. Now, in this setting, let us phrase this bipartite situation. So what will be a bipartite system and what are embezzling states in this setting? So the idea is that what we're looking at now is a triple consisting of the Hilbert space and von Neumann algebra and its commutant. And since we have this hard duality assumption, basically means that um, we will use only those systems where these uh, the, the von Neumann algebra is in standard form, meaning that um, the, the, the algebra that Alice has is essentially the same as the one Bob has access to, and they are related by uh, a natural operation, which, which is the so-called modular conjugation. And now um, an embezzling state will be formalized in the setting in the following way. So we have a resource state, omega AB, again, indicating that it's, it's a state of this shared resource system such that if you take any additional state, which uh, is a shared state on the local systems of Alice and Bob, yeah? so imagine they have, in addition to these uh, Neumann algebra M and M prime, they have some local matrix algebra MN and MM for Bob. 
Um, and now this uh, uh, psi will be a shared uh, state on this on these local finite dimensional systems, yeah, which were before um, symbolized by these these laptops. Uh, and now you want to ask um, for the following inequality, namely, if you have if you take any of these shared states and any error, then you want to find unitaries such that you can make this error um, smaller than epsilon, meaning that you initialize your total system with the resource and these local product states for Alice and Bob, and you act with unitaries locally uh, on the local system of Alice and the part of this uh, shared resource, which is accessible to Alice and the same for Bob. And you want to bring that state very close to the, to the target state you have, where you basically haven't changed your resource, but you created this entangled state for Alice and Bob. Um, so, so in this sense, uh, this is again indicated here below. So the unitaries that Alice can use in the setting are ones that live in this von Neumann algebra M, which is the copy, uh, which is the part of the resource system Alice can access and uh, operators locally acting on the system of Alice, which is this matrix algebra part. And now um, to understand these, this, this bipartite setting of embezzling, it's actually very convenient to try to transfer this to a purely um, monopartite setting in a sense, can we, uh, to, to a setting where we only talk about some quantity that refers to Alice system or Bob system. Uh, and in the tensor product framework, we actually know how to do this in, in the planning sense. So if we are interested in pure state entanglement between Alice and Bob, in a tensor product setting, then Nielsen's theorem tells us that we can also answer this uh, questions pertaining to, to entanglement theory for in this bipartite setting by looking at majorization theory for reduced states only on Alice or on Bob's system. Uh, so meaning that we can answer questions about entanglement of this shared target state, psi AB, by just looking at uh, quantities that refer to the Local marginal of Alice, so where you take the induced state on the on the local operator algebra of Alice or for Bob, and so to to get a handle on this, also in this embezzlement setting, we need uh, some definitions that uh, convert this bipartite uh, definition of embezzling to the monopartite setting, and we will say that a monopartite embezzling state, uh, state is monopartite embezzling if we just look at a state on the local resource system of Alice and some arbitrary error epsilon and then some arbitrary entangled state uh, or some arbitrary state on, on the local uh, system of, of Alice, uh, which is this uh, matrix algebra here. And then we ask whether there is a unitary in this algebra that can bring the, the, the reduced resource state um, and its tensor product with an arbitrary initial state, um, a pure state for, for this uh, subsystem of Alice arbitrarily close to, to another state on the system where this side doesn't have to be pure anymore. And the reason why we take here pure state is because uh, we initially consider in the bipartite setting this pure product state for Alice and Bob. So the marginal of it will also be a pure state, but of course the target state we want to achieve will be some entangled state. So it will be an arbitrary uh, state on the subsystem of, of Alice. Uh, so this is really just uh, essentially taking the definition in the bipartite setting and looking at it just for the reduced states. Then we get this monopartite statement. And um, since we are working with standard bipartite systems, meaning that, um, that that this von Neumann algebra M that describes the resource for Alice um, is in standard form. That means that every state we are looking at uh, locally uh, can be realized as a vector state in the setting. And the same is true for Bob, which has access to the to the commutant. Uh, and this is now very useful to prove the following first result, namely if we want to go from the bipartite to the monopartite setting, um, 
can actually directly do so. I mean, it's equivalent. Uh, I mean, it's equivalent to consider this embezzlement question in the bipartite setting and the monopartite one. Uh, and of course, the one direction is can is somewhat very easy. Huh? So if you have the the above inequality, then of course by just looking at the reduced quantities for Alice or Bob, you immediately get this uh, the the lower inequality. And the way to go back is actually due to the standard assumption because um, here we can now locally identify these unitaries for Alice. Then we have to be able to also get the uh, the unitaries from or Bob just from knowing those for Alice. And we can do this because if we are in standard form, we can use this uh, uh, modular conjugation we have in that setting to basically get a unitary on Bob's side that will then realize the above inequality. Yeah? So in the standard bipartite system setting, these uh, two questions are actually the same, whether we look at bipartite or monopartite embezzling. Now, um, brings me the next part of the talk, namely now we want to quantify embezzlement a bit more in the sense that um, in, in the embezzling state there we had this, uh, uh, this uh, these, these inequalities here which should hold for any uh, error epsilon. Uh, so basically meaning that you should be able to bring the unitary orbit of your initial system state arbitrarily close to your target state. Uh, so in the sense this corresponds to a the idea of having having zero error there once you allow for uh, optimization of arbitrary unitaries. And to quantify embezzlement also in a sense for states which are not themselves embezzling, but um, could be somehow close to embezzling states, we introduce the following quantity. Namely, we again look at this distance you know, where we take our resource state tensor it with an arbitrary density matrix on say the finite uh, system that corresponds to Alice local system. And then we look at the unitary orbit of uh, this initial state and compare it to um, the resource state tensor and arbitrary other state on the local system. So, and which which is achieved by this minimization over, the, over all the unitaries. Yeah? So this really just gives the distance of the unitary orbits of these states. Now we can also maximize this error now over all possible input states we have here. Yeah, and then since we're, we're also asking for arbitrary and, um, entanglement to be extracted in this embezzlement process, we will also maximize over all possible finite dimensions. Yeah, and this quantity we will, we will call kappa omega and that will be will play a, an important role in the rest of the talk. Yeah. So this quantity exactly quantifies like at least in, in norm distance how good or how well a state performs at this task of embezzlement. Yeah? So it would be zero if you have an embezzling state and the worst case scenario would be two. Yeah? So if you get two for this quantity, then this uh, state does the worst as embe at embezzling. Now, um, in addition to this uh, quantifier for a single state, we also introduce uh, to algebraic invariants, which um, we call kappa min and kappa max, which will be the best worst case error and the worst worst case error. Uh, so we additionally optimize this quantity over all states on M. So in this case, we mean normal states on M. And since uh, since these, these um, this kappa is a unitary invariant, uh, so these will be algebraic invariants for M. And later on, I will try to convince you that we can actually compute this invariance and find a very nice uh, and a very nice result in, that directly pertains to some other invariant that you can get for the for the von Neumann algebra M that describes the resource state. But to understand uh, the results that we get for this kappa min and kappa max, we first have to understand what uh, are the possible types of um, resource systems we can have. Uh, so, and here, uh, as I said before, we are talking about uh, factors. Uh, so for Neumann algebras with trivial center, and these are now classified into three different types. Uh, so that's uh, the uh, course classification. So you have type one, type two, and type three algebras. 
And each of these types has uh, further subtypes. So for the type one, you have the type one n, where n is some natural number or possibly some cardinal number. And essentially these algebras are just um, matrix algebras of dimension n uh, or the bounded operators of some Hilbert space where the Hilbert space dimension can be possibly infinite. And then we also have the type two algebras, which will not play so much of a role in this uh, this talk, which are then classified into type subtypes to one and to infinity. And the important uh, type for this talk will be the type three, uh, which is then further classified into a um, continuum of subtypes, which are the so-called three lambda factors, where lambda can be some value between zero and one. Uh, and here, uh, it's important to note that um, the first two types, so type one and type two, they are very distinct from type three in the sense that they have a trace, uh, at least the semi-finite ones, which is kind of densely defined uh, as a functional. And in the uh, in, in non-trivial, in a type three case, which is also called purely infinite, you don't have a trace, or if you try to define a trace, it will be trivial, so it will be either zero or infinite for all elements. And now this um, classification of or you know, type classification and subtypes for, for factors, that actually allows us to state the main result, which is uh, summarized in this table. Uh, so we can compute this invariance kappa min and kappa max for the various types. And we directly see that in the type three, uh, type one and type two situation, we always get two. Uh, so always the maximal error that is possible for uh, kappa min and kappa max, which uh, means that they cannot be any embezzling state on such a system uh, so in type two and type one. You don't get embezzling states because for an embezzling state, you would need at least kappa min to be zero. You know? And then you would still have to ask whether this um, kappa min can actually be attained by some state. But the situation is uh, much different for um, the type three case. In the type three case, we see that um, the kappa min can always be zero, you know? at least in the, I mean, apart from this kind of, uh, peculiar case of the three, uh, three zero factors. So meaning that in, um, and, and the, the minimum is actually attained in the three lambda case where lambda is not zero. Uh, so if you have a three lambda factor with lambda non zero, then you always get kappa min equal to zero and this is actually attained. And moreover, you can also com can compute kappa max and this will be of this nice form. Yeah? So you get a two for type three zero um, and then this kind of special formula uh, in terms of lambda for the type three lambda where lambda is uh, strictly between zero and one and you get zero for type three one. And um, so this type three one is actually an answer to the second question I mentioned. Yeah? So you get universal embezzling systems whenever you have a type three one factor because kappa max being zero means that all your states will have kappa omega equal to zero, which means that they are embezzling states. And um, well, for, for type three zero, as I said, um, there the situation is not so clear. So we know that this uh, kappa max is always two and kappa min can be zero and can also be two. So the situation can basically be the same as in the semi-finite case. So there are type three zero uh, factors where you don't have embezzling states, but there are also ones where you have embezzling states. And uh, yeah, so far we don't know much more about the range of this, uh, this kappa quantity in that case. But um, now the, the nice thing is that we see here is that if we exclude the type two and the, uh, the type one and the type two case, then this embezzlement quantifier can actually tell us the subtype within this type three algebra. Uh, so we directly recover this con classification of type three factors, which works in a slightly different way uh, from this embezzlement quantifier. So in this sense, the task of embezzling um, entanglement um, for, from a resource state, if you assume that the resource is a type three factor, can uh, 
actually give operational meaning to this con classification, which I think is uh, quite fascinating. And should also point out here that this combination uh, you get in the type three lambda case where lambda is strictly between zero and one, that's actually the diameter of the state space that uh, was um, famously computed by Korn, Hago, and Sturm. And so in a sense, kappa max is really equal to the diameter of the state space of these homal monitor bars. Okay, so now um, this brings me back to this question of how to translate um, questions between the bipartite and the monopartite setting in the commuting operator framework. Uh, so in the sense uh, this, uh, so, so because, because this is the way in which I try, now try to explain how we compute these values of kappa min and kappa max. Uh, so before I had told you that in the case of the tensor product framework, questions about entanglement of pure states in that setting shared between Alice and Bob is actually um, related to majorization theory for just looking at the marginals with respect to one subsystem. So how can we do this in the commuting operator framework or at least some, how can we find some replacement for this majorization theory? And the idea here is to use as the fundamental ingredient, the so-called flow of weights, which was introduced by Kon and Takazaki together with some additional ingredients, which we um, discovered in a paper by Hago and Stürmer. And for the rest of the talk, I will largely treat this flow of weights as pictured here as a black box, which achieves the following thing. Namely, you start with a von Neumann algebra and a state, and you should think of this as being the resource system and the possible and the resource state, which could be possibly an embezzling state. Now you feed this into this black box, the flow of weights, and what it spits out is a classical dynamical system, ergodic, together with a probability measure. Yeah. Yeah, so the von Neumann algebra will yield this classical dynamical ergodic system, and the state will give you some probability measure on the system. And now, um, for those of you who know a bit about the flow of weights, I will just um, tell you very roughly how this uh, works. So the idea is that you can look at the von Neumann algebra M. You have something which is called the modular flow on M. You look at the cross product algebra, which is formed out of M and this modular flow, which is essen which essentially means that you take the original algebra M and add to it some new generators, which are the unitaries that implement this modular flow. Now you can look at the so-called dual action, which is essentially acting with the characters of R as a group on these generators, and otherwise it acts trivially on M inside N. And now we can reduce this dual action to the center of N. So the center of N will, will be a commutative von Neumann algebra. So its spectrum will be some classical probability space if you want. Yeah. And the thing is that this dual action will be in the case where M is a factor, it will be an ergodic action on the center. And now the the Second important ingredient, which I can only sketch here, is this construction of Hargrove and Stürmer. Namely, now you can take a state on the von Neumann algebra M and again get a state on the center by first extending it to N and then again restricting to, uh, to the center in a very peculiar way, which is indicated here. So what you do is you have on, on N, so if M is any von Neumann algebra, this N will always be semi-finite. So there's a, there a semi-finite trace on it, faithful. And you can use it, you can look at the radon nicodym derivative of the extended state with respect to this trace, take this funny um, spectral projection of it and look at the restriction to the center and you will, and you will find that this actually gives a state on the center. And the state has, has very nice properties, which I will briefly mention later on. And um, now what we can actually infer from this whole construction is that um, the task of embezzlement for your resource system is actually equivalent to this uh, new probability measure here being invariant under this ergodic flow which you have on this classical system. Uh, so. This, uh, there's a direct translation between these two things. And this is essentially due to a theorem by Hagop and Stürmer, which tells you that the distance of unitary orbits of states on M is just the total variation distance of 
these uh, states on the center, which we call the spectral states. And this is why, uh, this is because it essentially contains all the spectral information of the state you started from, uh, uh, started with on the resource system. And um, moreover, as is shown in this uh, nice paper by Hargrove and Stürmer, is that you can actually characterize the image of this map that associates um, and this uh, probability measure to a state in a very precise way. And this is all, all these ingredients allow us to actually um, connect this to, to this embezzlement task. Now to, so since this construction is very abstract, let us have a brief look at how this looks like for matrix algebras. Yeah? So if, um, if the resource state was a finite dimensional system, essentially. Yeah? So in this case, the flow of weights is always just of the following form. So your, your probability space, essentially the half open interval zero to infinity and the, the ergodic flow you have on it is this rescaling by this exponential factor. Uh, you just rescale the coordinate variable. Now states on this matrix algebra, they are just given by density matrices in this case. And the probability density you get or the, the, the probability measure you get is characterized in terms of a probability density which uh, takes this form here. So it's uh, directly computable from the, from the multiplicities that you have for the various spectral values of your, your density matrix. Yeah? So basically you get a monotonously decreasing uh, um, function on this half infinite line, uh, which is continuous from the right. And these uh, some points of this uh, probability density, they are, located at the spectral values of your density matrix and the height is determined on by the multiplicities of the various spectral values. And now what we can do is we can look at the action of the um, of this um, restricted dual action on the on the flow of weights, which is just this rescaling by this exponential factor. And what we will see is that if we take an initial uh, probability density, this will just flatten out in this way yeah, under this flow. But this um, already suggests that in this setting, you cannot have an, an invariant probability distribution. Yeah. So in a sense, if your initial system was finite dimensional, yeah, uh, so which corresponds to the semi-finite case, you cannot have embezzling states because you cannot have invariant probability distributions with respect to such a flow in this setting. And we can um, make this a bit more precise in the following sense, that what we now do is we look at the behavior of the spectral state, which is given in terms of this D for matrix algebras, and look at its behavior under tensor powers. Why do we do this? Because what we, um, what we want to do is we want to compare the unitary distance between this your resource state tensored with a, with a, um, with a pure state and one where you tensor with an arbitrary state. And here for convenience, you use the normalized trace. Yeah, so, this, so it's kind of the maximally mixed state. And then you compare this to the, to, the, to the pure states. And now we compute the uh, probability density. And so with the pure state, we just get back the same probability density. But if we tensor with a normalized trace, so this looks like this will be just a rescaling of the coordinate of this uh, probability density and the overall uh, size of the density. Uh, and now the theorem we obtain from this, I will illustrate, um, is that state is embezzling if and only if this probability density is proportional to one over T. You know? And the reason for this is essentially the following. So, well, if omega is embezzling, uh, so we can look at the, probability density of omega, that's the same as the one of omega tensor pure state, but by embezzlement, since this is a unitary invariant, that should be the same as the one where we embezzle like from this uh, resource state to the normalized trace, but then it has to be equal to this rescaled version of the probability density. Uh, and then um, with the usual tricks, you can see that this actually implies that this has to satisfy the scaling law for any rational number. And then by right continuity, you get this one over T distribution. Yeah. But then since one over T is not normalizable on zero to infinity, you cannot have this. Um, so an infinite 
in, in finite the finite resource states are possible and uh, also since for semi-finite uh, factors where you have a trace the construction of the flow of weights basically works in the same way you cannot have embezzling states for semi-finite factors yeah. and again uh, the proof would be here okay you consider the flow of weights it's the same as the one for mn and then you would do the same trick and one over t is not normalizable okay but um now what have we learned from this uh, okay so um or, or one one interesting observation here is that um how does this relate to the um to, to this ergodic flow we have in the system yeah so we see here that this uh, tensor product with a normalized trace that really was i mean the effect of it was just this rescaling of the probability density you now with this additional weight factor but that's precisely the action on the probability measure of this ergodic flow we get from the flow of weights you know? so in this sense uh, the previous proof here uh, sorry, um, the previous proof tells us here what we're exploiting here in this proof is actually that this probability density is invariant under the flow of weights if it's an embezzling state you know? So this brings us to uh, one of the main theorems of our work, namely that this embezzlement quantifier is precisely equal to this uh, invariance measure for this probability distribution on the flow of weights. Uh, so you compare the probability distribution to its shift by the by the um, by this ergodic flow. You take the supremum over all possible shifts, and this is precisely equal to this embezzlement quantifier cover. So meaning if this is zero, this directly corresponds to the invariance of this uh, object under the ergodic flow. And um, so we have already can seen- Can I interrupt yes. you for a second? Yes. So I remember kappa min and kappa max, but I don't remember kappa without uh, like kappa. Uh, by kappa min and kappa max, where the optimization of these things, like the infimum over all states or the supremum. Oh, ah, yeah, okay. And the, and, and the kappa itself was just uh, optimizing the um, unitary orbits of omega tensor some density matrix with some other of this type over all possible dimensions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So now we, we have seen that in the semi-finite case, uh, this cannot work. Yeah? So there are no probability measures to satisfy this, but what about the, the type three lambda case? So how does the flow of weights look in, in, this, um, in this case? And um, well, in this case, if you just look at lambda between zero and one, you will find that the flow of weights is just the circle essentially. Uh, so it's a circle with rotations and the size of the circle or the radius of the circle is quantified in terms of this parameter lambda. And so this kind of directly tells you that um, of course here are here you can find invariant probability measures. So you just take the uniform uh, distribution on the circle in, I mean, uniform in the right coordinates. So you have to, instead of use this um, exponential version of the flow of weights, you basically map it, map it logarithmically to uh, some linear, uh, to, to some um, translation transformation. Uh, and then you see in this case, your flow of weights will be just a circle with rotations. So the invariant measure in that case is just the uniform distribution on the circle. So in this case, you always find the bezeling states because this uniform distribution is always in the image of this map this, that associates a probability measure to um, to a given normal state on your von Neumann algebra you started with. Uh, and this picture can even be completed with the type three one case, because in that case, the uh, flow of weights is trivial uh, because this algebra N from which you took the center is actually a factor. So in that case, the center is trivial. And the flow of weights is also trivial in that case, but also all the states are necessarily invariant in that case, uh, because you're just talking about a function on a point, uh, so it will be invariant. And the type three zero case does not really fit very well into this picture because um, in that case, um, the, the situation, situation degenerates a bit because any proper, uh, properly ergodic system can be the flow of weights 
of a type three zero factor. Uh, so this is also why this is very complicated to characterize in general. Uh, so essentially, this would if you wanted a classification there, you would need. Um, now let me again just briefly summarize again our main results. So we had these uh, kappa min and kappa max quantities, and we found that in the type three lambda where zero is excluded, we always have these embezzling states. And that's related to this previous slide because in that case, this classical ergodic system is just a circle with the invariant distribution being the, being the uniform distribution, which directly corresponds to an embezzling state. Okay, and um, yeah, in the type three, one and two case, embezzling is not possible. And in the type three, zero case, it's um, kind of hard to to um, to decide. Um, it's more like a case by case basis. But um, the very interesting case, I think, is the type three, one case um, where you actually have this universal embezzlement phenomenon, <clears throat> meaning that every part of the talk, let me just um, illustrate a bit more how this universal embezzlement actually characterized the type uh, 3 one situation. So this essentially rests on three crucial properties. Namely, the first is um, result due to Conan Sturma that a type uh, a factor is type 3 one if and only if it has a homogeneous state space, meaning that if you take unitary orbits of an arbitrary a state on such an algebra and compare it to any other state, then this distance to the uh, or the distance between two unitary orbits is always zero in this case. Yeah? And this already, I mean, this already looks very similar to this embezzlement problem. Yeah? And the only thing you also need to know to deduce that a type three one factor is a universal embezzler is that you have to know that type three one factors are properly infinite meaning that they are actually isomorphic to themselves times a B of H yeah, for an arbitrary uh, separable Hilbert space. Yeah. So you can tensor with any matrix algebra, but also with B of H. And you can even realize this isomorphism internally in M in the sense that um, if you think of this isomorphism as a unitary with uh, like, like if this H is n-dimensional with n components, and each, each of these n components will be a unitary, uh, would be kind of unitary object in M. Uh, so this is already internally realized. And if you put these two things together, that basically means that um, you get universal embezzlement for type three factors just from these two observations. And another um, way to see this, with, which I think is very nice, nice and which I wanted to mention here, it connects to uh, the modular spectrum. So what you what we can also show that if you have an embezzling state, then the modular spectrum of this uh, state is actually maximal in the sense that the spectrum of the modular operators always are plus in this case. So if you have an algebra that is universal embezzling, every state has this modular spectrum, which then means that the so-called con spectrum of this algebra is R plus, which then means it has to be type three one. Uh, so in this sense, uh, universal embezzlement always gives type three one factors, but also the other way around holds by these other two results. Yeah, if you have uh, type three one factors, you always get universal embezzlement. So now um, let me discuss uh, a bit more of uh, where we can actually encounter this uh, type three one factors. So the first place will be like statistical mechanics and certain infinite spin chains. And uh, the final part will also talk about uh, relativistic quantum field theory, where you expect these objects to appear uh, for the local algebras, uh, local observable algebras. But um, I think the this infinite spin chain setting that gives you a very nice way of understanding why this universal embezzlement implies the type three property provided you know this uh, Kohn-Sturmer result, namely that the state space has to be homogeneous. So to understand this, um, take your favorite infinite dimensional separable Hilbert space. And of course, this has to be isomorphic to um, such an infinite tensor product where you basically take 
uh, an infinite chain of spins with some uh, states locally on each spin. You know? So what you th could think of is like this infinite chain. Each of these um, squares here indicates a single spin with, with its state. And now what you find there is that um, the, uh, the Hilbert space and also the associated von Neumann algebra that doesn't, this algebra does not, re I mean, the structure of this algebra does not really care about what happens on a finite number of spins in the beginning of this chain. You know? So the whole construction is essentially only depending on the asymptotics of the sequence of states. And this means that um, you have the following approximation result in this setting. So if you take any state on such a spin chain, then this will be unitarily close to um, to a state where you just restrict the state to um, to the first n spins and tensor it with some arbitrary reference state on the remainder, uh, where this remainder state is, for example, the one that defines this uh, infinite tensor product. And now, um, if you think of such a, such a system as being a universal embezzler, well, that basically means that if you ignore the first n spins, then if your initial state was an embezzling state, also this remainder state has to be an embezzling state, yeah, because you're just throwing away some matrix factors. And in this embezzling, in this definition of embezzlement, it does not really matter whether you add some finite dimensional matrix algebra to the. Yeah, because you can basically extract that from the from the state which uh, which has this embezzlement property. So this now and and these properties now allow you to easily prove that a universal embezzler has to be type three because now what you want to do is you want to show that any two states on such a chain are unitarily close. How would you do that? Well, okay, you start with these two states. Now you do this unitary transformation, which brings you close to a state where you just have the restriction to the first n and some reference state. But since you now know that these uh, remainder states are universal embezzling, you can just find a unitary that brings them close to one another, you know, because this is essentially a finite rank, uh, finite Schmidt rank state on some matrix algebra, tensor and embezzling state, which is this ESOS state. Uh, so you exploit the unitary closeness of these two states and close this circle essentially. Uh, so this tells you already your initial states which you chose were unitary close. So in so you know if, if you have universal embezzlement in the setting, any state is unitarily close to another one. So it has a unit it has a, a homogeneous state space. So by Kohn-Sturm, it has to be a type three one algebra. Okay. And um, in this context, it's also very nice to come back to um, this idea of embezzling families, uh, because in the beginning I said that there was this observation by Van Damme and Hayden that you have these embezzling families, and we were now asking for kind of limits of these, these families. What we can do in the spin, spin change situation where we can look at our embezzling state and look at these restrictions to the first n spins. And by what I now said about this uh, this this, uh, um, this structure of of these spin chain algebras, what you can actually prove also in the wider context of hyperfinite algebras, meaning that you have like a weakly dense increasing union of matrix algebras, you can show that restrictions of an embezzling state to these finite dimensional subalgebras that are weakly dense uh, or their union is weakly dense will give you such an embezzling family. You know? So in this sense. These in, in, in these hyperfinite situations, these embezzling states are really limits of embezzling families. Uh, and these spin chains are special, special examples of hyperfinite algebras. Now um, come to the final section, namely the relativistic quantum field theory setting, and in a sense, the idea that uh, these universal embezzlers can appear in nature in the sense that, for example, the vacuum state of, of quantum field theory, at least in certain formulations, would yield such an such a, such an embezzling state, but also any other state on on the on the uh, in, in an appropriate bipartite state. So uh, to to understand this, we will use this algebraic formulation of quantum field theory, where we look at observable algebras, which are here for Neumann algebras associated with open bounded subread 
not necessarily bounded, but usually bounded subregions of Minkowski space, which is depicted here by this uh, conformal compactification in the form of a Penrose diagram. Yeah? So light rays move along uh, 45 degree directions, and this diagram in this sense captures the, the causal structure of Minkowski space time. And the idea is okay, you take take a region in Minkowski space time associated to it, associated to it with a Neumann algebra. Now you want some additional axioms to hold to for it to be admissible as a relativistic quantum field theory. Notably, you want uh, some kind of causality condition in the sense that uh, space like regions commute, meaning that if you take observable algebras associated with some region O1, then it if this is contained in the causal complement, uh, which is indicated here in this picture again with these regions O and O prime, in the causal complement of some region O2, then the operators in O1 should commute with those in O2. Uh, so because you cannot join them by uh, by any causal signal. You also, I mean, might want to require some causal completeness in the sense that um, the operators in this region O already determine all the possible observables you can have in the causal closure. And when you form this diamond, smallest diamond containing this region O, and for our setting, it's also very convenient to demand this Haag duality, which has a kind of maximality assumption on the observables that are associated with a certain region O, meaning that if you take the operators of the causal complement of a region, then these are actually all the operators that commute with uh, the uh, operators in the original region. And now to understand, to apply our bipartite embezzlement setting to this situation where what we will look at is basically a splitting of uh, space-time into two halves. Uh, so where Alice and Bob each have basically access to one of these halves. Uh, and then it's a general observation in algebraic quantum field theory that the observable algebras associated with these wedge-type regions in this case uh, are type 3, 1. And by what we well, what I discussed before, this means that if you look at the vacuum state in this situation as a bipartite state on these two uh, on these two systems, then this will be uh, an embezzling state, and in particular, because of this type three one property, any state uh, of this um, uh, of this system in this uh, relativistic quantum field theory setting will be a, we will be an embezzling state. And what is uh, nice is that this now gives a kind of direct operational interpretation of the diverging vacuum entanglement, yeah, which people often find in, in, in quantum field theory. And um, it also explains why you can maximally violate Bell inequalities between Alice and Bob, because essentially what you can do is you can use this embezzlement phenomenon to embezzle arbitrary Bell pairs from uh, from the vacuum state in this case. And this can be even quantified in terms of this kappa, uh, this embezzlement quantifier in the following sense. So if you look at these CHSH coefficients for a bipartite system and you apply it to the setting where you have these algebras M and M prime associated with Alice and Bob. Uh, so M and M prime would here correspond to AO and uh, OA and OB. Then um, this quantity that measures the maximum violation in a sense of, of a bell inequality that can be lower bounded by this uh, kappa quantity. Uh, and you see that if this kappa is actually zero as for an embezzling state, you get the maximal violation of two times square root of two. And one other thing I wanted to mention before, before I conclude is that um, in the beginning, we also had discussed this uh, phenomenon of exact embezzlement. So this idea that you not only have this up to some small error, but you actually want to set this error epsilon to zero. And is this actually possible in the commuting operator framework? So we know from, from, uh, from other results that it's not possible in the tensor product framework, but in this commuting operator framework, we see that it's possible, but it's only possible if we drop the separability assumption on H. And the reason for this is that, as I've shown 
before the modular spectrum of an embezzling state is uh, R plus. But if a state is exactly embezzling, then this has to be has to coincide with the pure point spectrum. Uh, so R plus would be the pure point spectrum of the modular operator of the state. And this is only possible uh, if your Hilbert space was non-separable. Okay, so let me um, conclude with some open problems. So actually it would be um, interesting in which, I mean, whether in this QFT setting, we can also understand how well Alice and Bob can localize the operations. I mean, we can use this, this hyperfinite setting to make some statements in, in this direction, in the sense that if you ask for a certain error, then you can, um, let's say, say how, how large the extension of, of the region Alice and Bob have to, ex have to have access to must be in this or should at least be. But um, in a sense, one would expect from, from other results in quantum field theory that this entanglement you have between two of these uh, wedge regions, which I discussed, that this is like localized close to the boundary of these wedges. So in a sense, one would expect that you can also localize these operations. Yeah, but, but this is uh, something we could not uh, determine so far, but it would be very interesting to, to see. Then, of course, um, let's say, is it possible to explicitly determine these embezzling unitaries in QFT, at least in a free one, let's say. Uh, if you look at the free field situation, can you write down somewhat explicitly what these embezzling unitaries would be? And then also related to this hyperfinite setting, which I discussed a few slides ago, is it possible to get embezzlers always as suitable limits of embezzling families? And here we also have an interesting um, result which uh, like points to the contrary, namely if you look at the Van Damme Hayden family and just think of it as a sequence of states on an ever increasing spin chain, then you can actually show that while the family has this embezzling property, it will not converge to an embezzling state. But what it will converge to in, it, in this case is actually the trace on a type of finite. These converge to something that is non-embezzling, and we have some ideas here because these, uh, if you if you think about this spin chain construction, we use an embezzling state to induce a family by this uh, restriction property. Then they satisfy embezzling in the sense of these families that uh, and Hayden defined. It. Some subtleties of how you have to what kind of properties you have to require for embezzling families decide whether they converge or not. That might be slightly stronger than the one for Dunn and Hayden looked at. And then of course, it uh, would be interesting whether one could also determine the range of this kappa quantifier, not only kappa min and kappa max, but uh, say more about kappa, uh, and say the, the possible values that kappa can take on the whole state space. And then another question would be, can we drop hard duality in the setting? So this maximality assumption on the observable or operations Alice and Bob have access to. The reason for this is um, because uh, if you're in the bipartite setting where you have a, like Alice and Bob have a pure state and you then this would always um, yield something which is called an reducible subfactor, but this subfactor might have non-trivial index. So meaning that hard duality could be violated in this setting. And so it would be very interesting since this uh, it comes naturally out of such a pure bipartite setting, whether you can extend our findings also to this, to this more general setting. And finally, well, can we also find other physically motivated embezzling many body systems, not, not only quantum field theories? And where we have some ideas about spin chains, yeah, at, uh, like at critical points, for example, the XY model, at criticality that also seems to, if it's in the infinite volume limit, exhibit this embezzling property. Okay, now let me conclude with this slide. And so I've given you answers to all of these three initial questions, some open problems, and so thank you for your attention. So thank you very much for this beautiful talk. 
Uh, are there questions or remarks? If so, please just unmute yourself and ask. Okay, I cannot see anybody at the moment. So um, maybe let me ask about this last part uh, concerning quantum field theory. There's bounds on kappa where they uh, for any Hackstler theory or just for free fields. So what's uh, what kind of um, framework it was? You mean this one? Yeah, for example. No, this one was uh, pretty general, so I think. Um, yeah, no, no. I mean, it was it was more in in the sense specific that you need this um, situation of these touching wedges, and you need the standard assumption. You know? So, let's say you need hard duality, and um, and you need to know that these are type three factors in a sense. Uh -huh, I see. Uh, then maybe following up on this, uh, is there any relation to split property in between embezzlement and split property? Well, one would expect because it also has to do with product states. Well, it didn't really show yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, so in a, in a sense, this, this maximal violation you only get if there's no split. Uh, uh -huh. So if you, because I mean, if let's say Alice and Bob had local algebras where you have a split property, uh, so, so they are like um, removed from one another by a finite distance, then we are not anymore in the setting where you can have hard duality, but you would have this sub factor inclusion, not even irreducible. Mm -hmm. And in that setting, it's not clear whether these uh, conclusions hold you know, because we then it's not so easy to translate between the bipartite and the monopartite setting. I see. Okay, I can see a question in the chat from Yota Nimoto. Does the crossed product with the modular group play any role? Um, yeah, I mean, it plays a role in the sense that uh, that's how you obtain this classical probabilistic system. Yeah. So you take your von Neumann algebra, you take the flow, uh, you take the modular flow from that you construct the cross product, go to its center, and that's the uh, that's the classical probability system you're looking at. And only in terms of this classical probability system and the induced state on it, you can decide whether you have this embezzling property or not. Okay. I suppose it answers the question. Any other questions or remarks from the audience? If not, then I would still like to ask about this type three zero. So at first sight, yes. that was the most interesting for me because it seems like maybe you could have a finer classification using the parameter kappa min, which takes values between zero and two. But then you made some rather pessimistic remarks. So mm. can I mean, you comment you, on it? I mean, using these con invariants, you already have a finer, finer characterization. So you have this S and T invariants of con, where S is essentially the um, like the intersection over all this modular spectra for faithful states, if you want. Uh, yeah. if the von Neumann algebra is sigma finite. And uh, the T invariant would be the possible periods your modular flow can have. Uh -huh. And so the S invariant is always zero, one. For, for type three zero, but the T invariant can be basically any subgroup of R. Mm -hmm. uh, so there you get a finer classification. But um, for the kappa min, yeah, it's, it's a bit unclear because we do not really have a good way to compute, let's say, um, lower bounds on this on this quantity. Uh, so because it would be nice whether we can whether we could decide that it's not zero in certain cases or or also upper bounds that it's not two. Okay. I mean, we, we there, there's, uh, 
I, I mean, maybe I should say there's also a nice paper by Hargob and Musad where they look at a related question. So they also look at like invariant states on the flow of weights. Mm -hmm. And um, they basically show that um, this is also related to the question whether you have certain embeddings which are completely um, was it completely bounded between the pre-duals of the phenomenal algebra. And they show that they can, um, but basically by looking at these isomorphism classes, which are related to the existence of these invariant states, they can um, get a finer classification of certain type three zero factors where the T invariant is always the same and also the S invariant, but they get different isomorphism classes in the sense. So it's a kind of related to this yeah. question, but it, but they, at least we don't know whether this can be answered in terms of this couple. So that's, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. But of course, I mean, also in the, in the three Lambda and in the three one case, it should be, um, I mean, the whole, the whole range of this Kappa function would be interesting to know, you know at least mm -hmm. from this uh, mathematical perspective. And I mean, the, the, the con invariant is only complete in the hyperfinite case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or only in that case, it, uh, the, the the type three lambda, let's say, excluding lambda equals zero, the 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 algebra is uniquely determined by the value of this lambda. Uh, if you drop hyperfiniteness, then that's not true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, any other questions or remarks? Also nothing in the chat does not seem to be the case, but maybe let's thank the speaker again. And let me uh, stop the recording. <laughs>